<coughs> Hi YouTube. One of the other recent topics to come up on Facebook it was is a baby born a sinner? And after reading a lot of the comments um, under this very popular thread, um, Father told me to speak on it. And this is what um, he told me to speak forward. Is a baby born a sinner? Try looking at it this way. When it comes to babies, they are obviously not sinners in terms of behaving in sin or having committed a sin by a course of action. But we are told that they are born in sin. So what can this mean? Well, if sin is to miss the mark, then it is clear something occurred through the process of conception, something passed on. How is something passed on to an embryo? Well, it is interesting that science has a recent interest in what they call DNA markers and how these markers can be connected to things like illness, disease and mental processes. So what if being born missing the mark simply means to be born with fallen or sinful DNA markers upon an infant's DNA? And the only way for an individual to be free of those fallen DNA markers is to undergo a DNA makeover by the blood of Christ. As the scripture makes clear that we are to become like or likened to Christ and that trying to be like him doesn't work, then that we must actually change. And what if what is actually changing is the very fabric of our DNA? I believe so. Is it impossible to imagine that Christ can override your DNA? No. As proven by the scripture, he can and has healed what our sciences would call hereditary diseases. In other words, DNA markers. The problem with this issue is people assume that to be in sin is limited only to an act of wrongdoing and therefore conclude that a baby must be innocent due to a lack of wrongdoing. But this is why the scripture says the sins of the father are placed on the son. It means transferred by DNA. Not that the child would incur the penalty of the father's sin, more that the result of the sin of the father upon the DNA of the father is transferred. The limitation placed upon the DNA of the father has been transferred upon the child as a DNA marker or a gene that has manifested and missed the mark or marker of perfection. Perfection in the sense of being perfected, the glorified state of existence enjoyed by the original Adam and Eve pre-fall. This can also include instances where certain genes have been deleted, switched off or completely missing from a genome. Now, please do not get me wrong and assume that I'm saying for one to be born with a genetic illness is somehow an indicator of sin because I'm not. I'm saying that we all equally have been born to our parents with some form of genetic markers that have missed the mark of perfect, perfection and glory. Now, I'm not suggesting I have all the answers. This is only attempt at explaining something that is often difficult to explain. And I, too, am limited in my ability to understand and limited by my knowledge and base and experience. But this hypothesis can be extended to include why God chooses certain individuals, DNA ready or particular qualities and traits specific for the role, and can also even help to explain predestination. The scripture is so clear on it, but so many argue the toss and say there is no scriptural support for DNA change. But I don't get it. To quote Willy Wonka, it's right there in black and white, clear as crystal. It's all over it. Metamorphu, um, to be changed, 3339, change after being with, change form in keeping with inner reality, sorry, change, changing form in keeping with inner reality, um, and that's also transfigured means, transformed and transfigured are the same metamorphu. We are meant to change each other after being in the presence of each other. This is for believers. Believers are meant to change each other after being in the presence of each other more and more until the entire body, every cell is complete. Every cell is vibrationally attuned to Christ, but don't get me started on the scripture regarding oscillating factors because that would just be ridiculous, wouldn't it? No, nope, it's in there, but not for today. Um, someone has had written, had posted under me and said, um, but we were made in the likeness of God blah 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 and people always forget that Adam and Eve fell yes they were made in God's image yes they were in perfection and glory but they fell after that 
And so many forget to acknowledge that Adam and Eve were made in his image prior to their falling. So these verses only help to validate the claim. So verses that posting, oh, well, we were made in his image and, you know, he was made upright in God, that all those verses only help to prove the fact that something happened to the DNA by falling from that garden. The seed of the servant, serpent having enmity with the seed of the woman. Now, does the does, does seed carry DNA? Yes. Even the seed of a plant carries DNA. And what is DNA? A set of molecular instructions. What are instructions from God? Commandments. Something happened to the DNA that caused the DNA to not follow God's perfect instructions. And as a result, it manifested itself in humans incapable of following God's perfect instruction because it wasn't on their DNA. You see, if you have in, um, imperfect instructions on the DNA, it's going to man manifest itself symptomatically in the person's thinking process or behavior. And, it, and if the DNA has messed up instruction then the behavior is going to be messed up yeah a body of imperishability is what we have been promised as believers a body infers mass christ revealed this body when after resur resurrecting he ate and drank and his hands were touched etc so he wasn't airy fairy he wasn't just a being of light he had mass he you could they were touching his hands and he was eating and drinking so he had physical mass he could eat physical food and drink physical drink christ um retained physicality but it was in a new form he metamorpho he underwent the process of metamorphosis so many fundamental errors of thinking are preventing the body of christ again the mass of christ from understanding these things we do not float away in spirit we are changed we are not separated from the flesh. Our flesh is changed into something more. Why is it the very distinction between, why it is the very distinction between transfiguration and transcendence? The whole world seeks to transcend. The whole, every religion on the planet seeks to transcend, transcend their flesh in enlightenment and, you know, travel with the stars and spirit in some consciousness you know some some trance of consciousness or whatever christianity is the only one that tells you very clearly to stay with the body and take the body with you to transform the actual body and take it that's the promise of christ and so many say oh but our promises are in heaven no heaven's coming to earth go back and read the bible again if you need to Study it every day, every minute of every day if you need to. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. On earth, manifest on earth. The old heaven shall pass away and the new, I mean the old heaven and the old earth will pass away in a new one. And that heaven comes to earth, the two become one. And because the two become one, the old heaven and the old earth become one, they sit, they pass away because they're transforming into something else. They're transforming into the one thing together. Um, Christ transfigured as a first fruit of many brethren. Therefore, they too shall transfigure. You need to study the word transfigure. I mean, the word gives it away. Transfigure. The figure changes into something else. The, tr the figure transforms. Conversion. Coming into the knowledge of Christ offers the gift of the Holy Spirit. But then, um, the reason I wrote this is because someone said, you're saying getting the Holy Spirit's not enough when you're a believer in Christ. Um, that... The minute you believe you somehow changes something else, which is not what I said. So this was the answer. Conversion or coming into the knowledge of Christ offers the gift of the Holy Spirit. <coughs> then we, as we mature, most don't, in the faith, are called to endure and remain steadfast in that faith. As the dross is burnt off through the fiery trials, we are transformed. Most reject the blood of Christ through their trial. And just like a blood transfusion recipient often, receive, um, often rejects the blood of the donor, 
that can save their life. The true conversion or complete conversion is one in which the whole body has been subdued and not just the mental faculties. Theoretically in agreement with the idea of Christ and not just the heart emotively hoping on a reality of Christ, but a full body conversion of one thing into another. Like it is said, you know them by their, by their fruit. Is not fruit the DNA offspring of a seed? Until the Holy Spirit in you produces its offspring of fruit within you and completes the metamorphosis of change, you have not finalized your consummation in Christ. And to finalize the consummation in, in Christ is to actually receive and not reject the blood of Christ through you. Through your DNA, through your through your life is in the blood. Um, there are some other videos that have been done on this. Uh, Catherine Baltzell did a great one, Life is in the Blood. Um, and I did some earlier videos about two or three years ago now on um, the blood and the change in Christ. Even, I mean, even the whirlwind um, is about wormholes. So... You know, we have all these videos, they've all been done, but, it, you know, we're finding that it has to then be said again and again and again in another way because some people just are not getting it, which is fine. You get it when you get it, but there's a need for us still to speak about it. So this is what's going on on Facebook, and therefore if it's in, you know, the mind of the microcosm in a small little area, there's also a lot of it being thought on the same level in the macrocosm. So this is why I'm transferring over to YouTube so that um, it can be addressed to anyone out there who has the same uh, misunderstandings or the same blocks in their understanding. Um, I could have spent another four hours and given you all the Bible verses and stuff, but to be honest with you, it just it takes too long, and it is your responsibility as a believer in Christ to go and study the Word. So if I've used the Word and you think, where's she getting that? Then take it upon yourself to go and study the Word. Go and study the words in the Strong's Concordance and have a look for you. Or ask the Father, ask, ask the Lord, you know, what is she talking about, Lord? Is this true? Um, because there are plenty of us already that experience this as a reality. It's not just a thinking process. It's a reality. Our bodies are changing. Our minds, our mind, he is rewriting our mind. He is rewriting our heart. He is rewiring, you know, the synapses in our brain in a real literal sense. So if you're not experiencing that, then I, then I really do suggest you ask the Father, what's going on? What's going on with me? What do I need to understand? What am I not getting? You know, because this isn't just words for our, for for a lot of us. This is experience, okay? Uh, and that's not to insult anyone or to suggest that anyone else doesn't believe. But maybe you're a believer who is still, um, you know, not yet being changed. I mean, that's um, changed physically. Maybe that maybe that's the the reality for you, uh, which there's nothing wrong with that either. But. Anyway, there's a few other things that I want to talk about today, and these might, you know, become uh, more videos. The Lord's not really having me do a lot of videos lately, so if he puts it on my spirit to do more, you know, they can morph into something else, but I'll put another, a few links underneath of some older videos of mine and the really good one of Catherine's, and um, we'll just see what happens, but thanks for listening. Um, oh, sorry, I have to find the way to turn this off again. Bye for now.